much for attending. Um, we're going to be looking at two models that are alternatives to highest and best use. One of them is called most probable use, and it's a really practical model, and it's, I think, simpler and uh, easier to use than highest and best use. And then we're going to use, we're going to have a look at another model that uh, is uh, very holistic and futuristic uh, that comes primarily from uh, a professor at uh, Berkeley University in California. So, the first model we're going to look at is most probable use, and uh, we're going to compare it to highest and best use and why it, it's better. At least in my view, it's a lot better. And we're going to look at you know where we are now, our current appraisal doctrine, and our notions about objectivity and uh, certainty and values. So. Um, It'll be a well-rounded, I think, explanation of most probable use. And then we'll move on to uh, the next one, which is called complex adaptive systems. And uh, as I say, this is a really interesting perspective. It's a very broad perspective and takes in way more than land use. It takes in really uh, many aspects of our life, but I will tie it to uh, real-life examples of, of land use. Um, that model also, um, I think, gives us some direction for leadership uh, roles for appraisers and also how to be better followers. So I've just given you the first three slides. So now we'll move directly into the history of highest and best use. Um, I'm a geezer, so I remember uh, way back to 1975. Um, I'm betting a lot of you weren't born then, but I won't ask. I won't ask who. So, back in 1975, highest and best use essentially was the most profitable use. Um, there weren't many considerations. Uh, given to anything other, I mean, it had to be legal and it had to be possible, physically possible, but uh, it's essentially highest and best use meant the most profitable use. And, th and then we got a more uh, sophisticated, de detailed uh, explanation, and this is the second one on the slide there where, where the four factors were clearly articulated, physically possible, so on and so on. You guys know all this stuff. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into it. Um, and then folks started to realize that well, some other things were going on. You know, public buildings were going up, and they're not profitable. Uh, and there's environmental concerns now, and there's and there's um, social factors involved. And so, um, our teaching and our dogma and appraisal. Um, recognize this stuff. And that's about where we've got to now. So I'm asking the question here, why bother or who cares? Uh, I guess all those who need CPD credits before the end of the year care. Um, but here's some reasons why I think uh, we should use most probable use or we should at least know about it. Um, in the past, the history of appraisal is that most of our concepts and our theory have been developed by somebody else, not appraisers. They've been developed by the courts, and they've been developed by economists, and they've been developed by accountants. And, and I can't think of another profession. I'll invite you to, to, uh, to type one in as a... As a on the chat screen, I can't think of another profession uh, that hasn't developed its own theory, where, where they've left it to somebody else. So I think we should develop our own theory. And I think it will improve the status and the credibility of appraisers, uh, 
both in your community and, and around the world. I think this model is easier to use than highest and best use. So that's why I say it'll make your life easier. And uh, I think it'll, it improves the read readability of, of your reports. Uh, because if it's tough for us to understand a concept, appreciate how tough it is for, for a lay reader. So what's the big difference between highest and best use and most probable use? In one sentence, the difference is we're going to be talking about most probable use instead of most profitable use. So, so most probable use is just what it says it is. It's an inquiry into the probable uses. And we don't have to get involved in the gymnastics that occurs when we're talking about highest and best. You know, highest on what scale? And best for whom? Best for the banker, best for the developer, best for the First Nations, best for the environment. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So here's a little more detail on most probable use. Most probable use does a few things. One of them is it acknowledges that there's a lot of crazy stuff going on when the actual use of a property is being decided. And I'm speaking primarily of commercial properties here. Um, things, that, things that highest and best use doesn't directly take into account, although you, if you're an experienced appraiser, you're doing it anyway is that there are short-term budgetary constraints. You know, the developer may have two other projects on the go, and this may be the case for a, a residential development too. The developer may have two other projects on the go, and he may be pretty much maxed out at his bank. And so the next project he does, which he wants to do because he say he's got adequate labor, um, he has to scale it back. And the reason he scales it back is because he can't get the money from the lender. And so he's not about uh, developing to the most profitable use. He's about getting, uh, getting the project on the go. And likewise, there could be uh, short-term uh, shortages of labor or expertise. And then there's the general uncertainty that, that results in urban plans. Uh, if you've ever been involved with... Uh, 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 if you've got areas of your town that are zoned where where uh, where the developer submits um, a plan and the and the rules aren't cast in stone and the, and the, the ground is forever shifting, um, there's that kind of situation, and then there's the various habits and idiosyncrasies of the players. For instance. Um, I know two developers here in town who, who have been very successful over their careers building strip malls that maybe have four or five bays, maybe 800 to 1,200 square feet each. And if they get a site that's uh, a little bit larger or might uh, actually be okay for a mixed use, you know, with second floor residential, uh, they stick to what they know because they know they can make that work. And so instead of building to the most profitable use, the most probable use in this town for uh, uh, neighborhood commercial development is for a four, five, six bay strip mall. So there's another example where this isn't about most profitable. It's about what's probable. And to answer the question, what's probable, you need to know what's going on in town and what the players are. And here's another example I give. Well, I've talked about the developer and how he can have problems with his lender. So imagine that the banker's wife is president of the Heritage Society. And the site that the developer wants to develop has a heritage building on it. How is life going to be for the banker? 
So you can see how various idiosyncrasies can come into play. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the banker shouldn't be uh, concerned about uh, what his uh, wife is telling him because she represents a constituency in the community. She represents one of the values in the community, in this case, that sector that I'm just reading the note at the bottom there. Um, a certain sector of the community. And as we're going to see, one of the problems with highest and best use is that it presumes that everybody's working like clockwork. That what the city hall wants and what the banker wants and what the developer wants and what the tenant wants, everything fits really, really smoothly. And that's how we get to most profitable. But in fact, all of these forces are working uh, towards their own interest. And often they're in conflict with each other. So here's what we're going to do with most probable use. And you can see how similar it is in some respects to highest and best use. We're still going to be uh, having to pass the threshold of physically possible, legally permissible, and financially feasible. Uh, but then in just instead of just having a, I don't mean to uh, diss on it, but a, a really simplistic conclusion about most profitable use, we have to look at what's going on. And we have to resolve the, com the competing needs of uh, what I've listed as three groups, the space suppliers, which would be the developers, and I also include the lenders in that group, and the space users, and then the infrastructure, which is City Hall. So there's the basic outline of, of uh, what most probable use is. And this is the sort of thing that, that one might see uh, as an introduction to the uh, land use section in an appraisal report instead of what you're using now. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about each of those three groups. And the first one is the space suppliers. And we've already talked about space suppliers have short-term constraints like cash flow financing, uh, labor supply, and, uh, and then their own, their own ideas about what's going on in the market and what they should do. And I've talked about that, about the strip mall guys. The other space uh, part of the space suppliers are the are the investors because they're going to buy the buildings and uh, make them available for rent, and they have the very same short-term constraints. They may be they may be maxed out in terms of uh, their investment portfolio, and they see a really good deal, uh, but they can't buy it because uh, again for uh, labor and capital reasons. Uh, Investors are also constrained by uh, uh, illiquidity and interest rates, um, and again, their own decisions they've made about where the market is is going. So the other space suppliers include um, uh, the lenders. Uh, because, you know, they're making money off the investment as well. And obviously, uh, appraisers know better than just about anyone that they have uh, significant input into uh, whether a project's going to go ahead and what's the scale of it. And even owner-occupants, um, um, sorry, got a slide here mixed up here. No, here we are, space users, everything's actually on track. The only thing that's mixed up is me. So what happens with space users in the model of most probable use? When we look at what they actually do, and for instance, uh, when there's a downturn, what happens? Uh, tenants can do a number of things. They lease less space. They get behind in their rent. They sublet part of their space to somebody else. 
Uh, if it's residential, they move in with their parents, uh, or they do the midnight move, um, where they grab their furniture and they're gone by Monday morning. So, so this is one of the conflicts that, that I'm talking about that that affects the use of property, and it's it's things that you know the experienced appraiser is knows are out there and he's considering them but they don't turn up if you just stick to the book in terms of a of a, the idea of most probable use so now we come to the third group okay just hang on a sec here all right sorry so now we come to the third group which is infrastructure and special interest and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, developers and owning, owners applying for a zoning change. Uh, and that's obviously a situation that generates conflict. Uh, and it can't be resolved simply by uh, looking at what's the most profitable use. Um, Likewise, federal and provincial agencies have their hand in things, and they have their own interests, uh, which, uh, especially with an, in an older building, and uh, building code compliance is, a, is an interesting area about what they will uh, allow to remain as it is and what they want brought uh, uh, up to the current code. I talked a little bit about special interest groups and uh, and mentioned that um, uh, special interest groups represent one of the values that are out there in our community. And if you think about it, the conflict that arises in our community over land use, uh, you know, whether it's the preservation of a green area or uh, or whatever, uh, it relates to different values. And that's what causes that's what causes the conflict, uh, and that's what this model is prepared to say. Yeah, we see this going on. We know this is here. I'm just going to read a couple of the questions here. Um, Is there a limit to the percentage of units that can be sold for investment in a given building in BC? Don't know. Uh, oh, you think I'm in BC, maybe. I'm in Saskatchewan, actually. I'm in um, Saskatoon. And um, um, here, uh, I'm also a retired lawyer, by the way. In Saskatchewan, we have a law that says you cannot constrain... Uh, rental activities in condominiums. So, um, so the board of a condominium and the owners cannot pass a uh, bylaw here that says um, uh, that limits the amount of rental units. Heather asked, this would apply to legal secondary suites. Um, I'm not quite following what you're saying, what would apply, like the percentage of, I don't follow. Um, maybe you could clarify if you want to, uh, want me to try to answer that. So maybe this is a good place to stop uh, and invite questions. Um, if you have any questions that the players have convict, uh, conflicting goals and that the most probable, uh, most profitable use is really too limited, uh, it's too narrow a view of, of what's going on. And then I'm re-emphasizing here that there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in this. And this uncertainty, I'll talk a little bit more about uncertainty. 
The uncertainty when you're reaching a conclusion about highest and best use or most probable use is not necessarily because you don't have enough information. You know, we have this notion that if we just got enough information, we would get the right answer. And in fact, everybody would get the same answer. But we know that hasn't, in the history of humanity, that hasn't happened. Three appraisers will always disagree, right? And it's not necessarily because they're incompetent or whatever. It's because there is uncertainty inherent in what we're looking at. Part of it is chaotic. So here I'm just giving a list of the kind of resolutions uh, that might occur when you're using the most probable use model on uh, a property. You might see that, uh, and we've ta I've talked about this, um, you might see that the project is scaled back because uh, of labor or capital shortages. Uh, I've talked about strip malls. I talked about the Heritage Society. Um, I've talked about what happens when, when demand drops. Um, and I'm, I'll talk about ethnic and cultural groups that dominate the marketplace uh, um, a little bit later. Uh, suffice it to say right now that uh, uh, some ethnic groups um, don't hold profitability as uh, high in their scale of values as um, a mainstream part of Canadian society. And so they, rather than choose the most profitable uh, uh, choice, um, they will choose one that improves their relationships. Um, the example uh, I'm thinking of was I appraised uh, 300 cottage sites on, um, on a Indian reserve. And the First Nations uh, peoples, we have about, uh, I think it's five reservations in Saskatchewan where there are leased land for resort properties. And in most of those, but not all, uh, the, the band council uh, has demonstrated over the years that they will take less than the appraised uh, value rent when the rent is being renegotiated. They're more interested in a good relationship uh, than they are in maximizing the dollar. I'm just going to read uh, I'm reading um, the comment, found your comment about economists' significant input and theory interesting. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, I think I think uh, not just economists, but our theory should develop in a way uh, that we can serve as much of the Canadian community as possible. Uh, I'm saying that we should show a little more leadership ourselves in uh, in developing the theory uh, rather than having someone else do it. And as I'm going to talk about later, uh, some of the problems we have with highest and best use are uh, because um, that term was developed uh, initially outside of our profession. Um, Manson asks, does uh, probable use uh, and highest and best use typically align more in metropolitan cities versus um, rural situations. 
you will have um, um, you will have uses for land and buildings in both rural and urban settings which are not the most profitable use. Um, um, I'll talk about more about this particular farmyard later, but I appraised a farmyard that was recently that was maybe it was um, 15 to 20 acres and it was beautifully treed. And it was land that could have been in crop production, um, but it wasn't. Um, um, I've run into situations um, in small rural settings where uh, an adjacent landowner wanted to buy land that was owned by one of the railways that had been vacant and unused for a hundred years and the railway said no for no particular reason and then two years later the railway put the land up for sale. Do lenders accept this new approach to highest and best use? Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, I have used it even in um, a number of court cases where because QSPAP says that uh, we're using highest and best use, um, I have to put that in the report, you know, that, you know, here's the highest and best use definition. And then I say, you know, there's another analysis here, and I, and I, I put the two together. And uh, uh, so I've... I've uh, substituted or broadened the notion of profitability to include all these conflicts and uh, 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 situations. Uh, currently, um, I have put a pro proposal before the various committees of the Appraisal Institute um, to see if this can be uh, added as an alternative. Um, and the final thing I'll say about that is, and I'll come to it again later, is if you look at the uh, teaching materials uh, that the Sauter School has developed, you will see that in the highest and best use sections, they use the term most probable use over 20 times. Because it's the only way you can handle situations related to land use. You can't handle them with the word highest and the word best. So um, check out your textbooks uh, and you'll see that that's some of the gymnastics that uh, some, some very good writers have had to use to... Uh, to explain highest and best use, because it's not highest and it's not best. Um, yeah, I talked about misdirection. Well, the misdirection I'm I was I was saying that uh, most profitable use can be misdirecting. All the examples I've given where. Uh, where most profitable use isn't the isn't the most probable use for the land. That is, the land is way more likely to be used for something else. That's what I'm talking about when I say misdirection. I'm not sure uh, with Manson's question about metro city versus rural townships, uh, whether I answered your question, I'm not sure um, when you're saying I'm not sure you're, what you're asking aligns more with city or town because I'm not sure what you meant there. I see you're typing now, so I'll just um, hang on for a second. Right. 
rural townships. I'm going to um, I'm going to soldier on, and uh, uh, you can if you if you if you want to give up on me, that's fine. But if you want to try to knock it into my head, uh, 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 you can keep writing. So he, here's just another resolution example. I'm talking about a residential area. Uh, most of the houses are 2,200 square feet. Um, and somebody puts up an 1,100 square foot home. Um, um, it's, it's not the most, uh, doesn't create the most utility. Um, and it's not the most probable either. Okay, here's an example uh, uh, close to my heart. I uh, my office is in the Riversdale uh, Business District, and I sit on the Riversdale Business Improvement District board. And uh, there is some vacant riverfront land, Riverview land, and it is one of say three possible sites for a, a new arena and events venue. And uh, I wrote a letter to the paper, which was published, and I said, you know, this is not great use for riverfront land because when you build an events venue, everybody is looking inwards towards the event. They're not looking outwards. And so uh, the, the benefits, um, you can't exploit the view. You can't maximize the, the uh, benefit of the view building uh, an arena. And the other thing I said was this arena site, it's on the river, so there's no access from that site. And there's a freeway on one side, so there's no access from that site either. And then the third side is residential. And my colleagues on the Business Improvement District Board want the arena built there because it will bring them some business. They are a special interest group and they want more business for themselves. And so I wrote this letter uh, and there are two alternative sites. One, one is an old uh, Canadian Pacific uh, rail yard and um, which is just off the side of the downtown core and would be a pretty good site. But probably, I mean, I, I'm thinking people like the notion of having the new venue on the river, this grand building uh, on the riverfront. So there's a situation where, where the best, uh, the most best use of the land the use it would be the most profitable, which probably be a high rise, right? So everybody can enjoy the view, whether it's an office or residential. Um, may very well not happen. Um, so that's an example where the values of the community are in conflict and uh, uh, the most profitable use is not likely to happen. I'm just reading uh, the notes here. The strip mall. The mess to try to clean things up for teaching and for theory. Uh, one of the current textbooks says that for a certain portion of appraisers, highest and best use is most probable use. They are always equal. And then it says, but for some, and I'm one of them, um, it's not, because highest and best use is based on a maximization of profit, and, and most probable use is based on a probability analysis. You know, if I look in a neighborhood and I, I see there are, in each block, there's something like uh, eight large two-story houses and four kind of 12 to 1400 square foot bungalows. Um, I know what the probability is that if, if another block is put up for sale, 
I have a probability figure of, I'm assuming everything else is equal, of, of what's the probability of a larger two-story house and what's the probability of a, of a smaller house. I'm going to skip this. Um, oh, how are we doing for time? I'm going to skip this example. Maybe we'll come back to it if we have some time. About social service agencies, um, maybe every city has this. There'll be an area. Often it's a ghettoized area, and there's a concentration of social service agencies. Maybe there's 25, 35 of them all in one small area. And, and the research indicates that they're perpetuating the problem or making it even greater. But I think we should move on here. Okay, so this is just a review of most probable use. Here we are, the same one, two, three are the same as highest and best use. And four, instead of, res, instead of uh, most profitable use, where the appraiser is going to be looking at, you know, how is this mess of factors going to resolve itself? Sometimes it's very simple and sometimes it's complicated. And a lot of the time you are going to reach the very same conclusion as highest and best use. One difference, one benefit remains for using most probable use, and that is even when they are the same. And that is that most probable use means exactly what the words say. That's the most probable use. And highest and best use, um, as we're going to get into a little bit later, uh, we don't really know what that is. But before we get there, we're going to move on to another issue, theoretical inconsistency. Um, maybe just to um, uh, keep you involved, before I show the next slide, I'll invite you to try to remember or jot down what you remember about the definition of market value is. The traditional definition of market value, and it happens to be the one that the Appraisal Institute's using now too, and it's one of the accepted definitions in the uh, American Appraisal Institute. So, market value, market value, What a property would sell for on the open market, says Allison. Yes, I agree with that. Given a reasonable exposure time. Well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, well, maybe I jumped ahead in my thinking here. Here's the answer here. Market value relies on most probable price. And I thought I had the definition in here. The, the traditional definition currently used is that market value, and you've, you've got it right after proper. The most, here, somebody put it, oh, I got a whole lot of answers here. Uh, uh, David Bradley writes the most probable, pri probable price that it would sell for. And, and uh, Jeff Pike writes the same thing, the most probable price. And then Don has written up above the highest price. And it used to be, when I was a young appraiser, the definition of market value was the highest price that a property should bring. And then someone asked, well, why should you pick the highest? Why wouldn't you pick the most probable, the most likely price? And the definition we have the traditional, the, de the current definition that's employed most of the time in Canada is we're talking about the most probable price. I see several others of you. Okay, so, so market value is relying on the most probable price, not the most profitable price. Okay. So if we're using a definition of market value that re relies on most probable price, and we're using a definition of uh, highest, uh, highest and best use, 
that relies on most profitable price, we're not, uh, we have our left hand and our right hand aren't working together on this. Um, it used to be, as I said, the definition of market value was the highest price and the definition in highest and best use was the highest price or the most pro uh, in other words, the most profitable. So we've got, we've got two definitions that are at odds now. And I write here, um, highest and best use relies on most profitable use, not most probable use. And this may drive the analysis to a value higher than the definition of market value, right? Because market value isn't saying highest anymore. Market value is saying the most probable price. And then we get to highest. I, I think I beat that up well enough already. Ah, this is my favorite slide. This is the one I'm proudest of. Can anybody guess why? <laughs> uh, Dennis asks, for an investor, wouldn't most profitable price override most, wouldn't most profitable use override most probable use? I think, I mean, obviously, most of the time that's true. Most probably, they're both going to give you the same answer. But there will be situations where an investor is going to put other values ahead of profit. Um, you know, you may have an investor who wants to uh, leave a legacy. He wants to be known as someone who wasn't just out for profit. Um, you might find an investor with a conscience and um, he wants he wants to invest in uh, buildings that are uh, environmentally mm, safe or environmentally well built, and he will uh, uh, prefer that to profit. Uh, Jason writes, the highest price a property should bring uh, is not necessarily the most probable price. Correct. Not necessarily. Um, let me give you an example of... Uh, um, oh, I did, a, I did an auto body shop uh, in a small urban center. And... Um, I concluded that the most probable use and the highest and best use, because I still have to comply with with uh, what the institute uh, has in its QSPAP, excuse me, <coughs> is as a warehouse, any number of different warehouse uses. And I said, based on what I see in the marketplace for auto body shops, and the and the demand that they are experiencing, I think there's only about a 20% chance that this building will sell uh, for use as an auto body shop. But if it does, the owner can expect to get more money for it because his uh, $45,000 paint booth and uh, uh, air filtration system will have value. Whereas for most users, uh, well, uh, for an industrial use, they won't, they won't give any value to it. This goes back to that question that I forget who it was. Manson asked about uh, big city versus small urban, and this, this is a really good example. If this building were in a large city, like I'm talking 200,000 people or more, there's no question that it would be an auto body. Uh, but in a small town, um, uh, not so much likely. Factual, maybe I'm not grasping the question. That's a factual question. Either it's the most probable or, or it isn't. And that's what I like about using this term most probable use is is it's factually driven. You can go to the marketplace and say, well, 
how many buildings are being used are, 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 are in this use and how many are in that use. Um, you know, we have a differentiation here in Saskatoon between owner-occupied uh, industrial buildings and investor um, and tenant-occupied industrial buildings. And you presently, if, if a potential owner, owner user is going to buy the building, he will pay more than an investor. Anyway, so no one guessed why I love this slide. It's because I had apples in green and oranges in orange. So the point of this slide is being uh, theoretically consistent. Thank you, Jason. Being theoretically consistent, either you have to go with highest and best use based on most profit and then market value defined as the highest price. Are you with me? Or you can go with most probable use, which defines most probable use as most probable use, and tag, uh, tag team that with a market value defined as the most probable price. Okay, so that's the apples to apples and oranges to oranges thing. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get back to my Apple slide here. So what's happened over the last 40 years in uh, North America is that we moved from the highest price, market value defined as the highest price, we moved from that to market value defined as the most probable price. That's all well and good. I think it's a good move. But then we didn't follow through and change the definition of highest and best use from most profitable to most probable. Okay. So this is just a summary of, uh, of the differences. Value conclusion will differ in some circumstances uh, I'll skip that example for now. <sighs> so maybe we should take uh, any questions here. Okay, well, if you wouldn't lenders, here's a question from Brad, wouldn't lenders prefer most probable use over highest and best use? Uh, Anybody want to vote on that? Yes or no? Here's, um, here's my take on it. I think vendors prefer, or lenders, prefer most probable use because it's really simple to understand, first. And second, if they're really um, conscientious, I don't know how to put this, if they're... If they're really conscientious, then the answer is yes. But you'll get situations where a lender really wants to make the loan. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a client with a really strong covenant. The guy's got lots of money. The lender wants to maximize the loan on this building because, you know, the, the, de the developer needs... Uh, as much money as he can on this because he happens to be a bit cash flow strapped, but he's a, he's a really good bet for a loan. And so if we, if the appraiser uses highest and best use and, and um, comes out with a, with most profit, um, then that's what the lender would want in that case. You guys are great. You're understanding what I'm talking about. Um, Philomena writes that I would think they would want MPU, but they seem to want HBU. Um,
Yes, some lenders are risk adverse. Um, I was in the lending business for a while, and <laughs> there used to be there used to be loan managers and collection managers, and you'd send a loan manager out to a branch for several years, and he'd loan money. Everybody in the community liked him, and then you'd and then you'd move him on to another branch that needed to bulk up their business, and you'd bring in a collection guy, and he had to deal with all the defaults. Uh, Darren writes that HBU is traditional, and I think that's a lot of what's going on here. Is uh, uh, older lenders, in particular, have always uh, dealt with highest and best use, and so that's what they're that's what they're used to. <laughs> okay, is that Dawn there? Did you uh, have you implied the OK Boomer thing there when you say "Me too" eighteen years? You saying I don't use? Uh, reminds me of a statement Mike Tyson made: "Was uh, everybody's got a good plan till they get hit in the face?" Okay, highest and best use. Uh, there are some uh, traditional values embedded in highest and best use, which which uh, I think we need to be explicit about. Uh, first, I want to talk about highest. And when we say highest, uh, highest on what scale? A profit, the public good? We all know that many profitable enterprises aren't in, the, aren't in the public good. They're not in the interest of the environment. They're not in the interest of ethnic minorities uh, and so forth. So highest on what scale? And then the next piece, best, is even more of a puzzle. Best for whom? Best for the owner? Best for the banker? Best for the politicians? Best for the environment? Uh, best for a sense of community well-being? And to get around the words highest and best and you end up in the textbooks end up talking about most probable use like I say 20 times in each chapter it's because you can't make any sense of these words in our uh, situation of using them with land use ah so yes now we come to the second history lesson the first, the first history lesson was where I said about the old highest and best use concept was, which was about profit, and then, and then the more recent one, which had the four factors and so on. So here is where the term highest and best use came from. Irving Fisher uh, uh, got the first PhD in economics from Yale University, and he wrote a book in 1930 and this is the first known use of highest and best use in a, in a financial or academic setting. And he was describing the stock market. And it was all about profit, profitability. These were highly liquid investments that could be sold in a day. Uh, there was no question about legality or physically possible. So... Real property appraisal took this stock market term and then we grafted on some of these conditions. And, uh, and, and that's how we ended up with this term, which, as you can tell, I don't think fits very well. Um, in 1977, I won't, we don't have much history, so bear with me. Uh, James Grasscamp was a professor at uh, Wisconsin University, and uh, he wrote this monogram called Most Probable Use in the Appraisal of Such and Such a Property. And this was where the term most probable use got coined, and he was the guy who came up with, you know, we stay with, we stay with uh, physical 
physically possible and uh, legally allowable and um, financially feasible. But then we go to the resolution of the issues between space suppliers, space developers, or space users, and and infrastructure and special ed. So he is the guy. Most of what I said was James uh, Grasscamp's work. Here in Canada, and this is just four years after Grasscamp's article came out, 1981, uh, Lincoln North was an Ontario uh, appraiser, and he wrote a monogram of about 30 pages on highest and best use. And in it, I, I, I still think it's the most uh, in-depth discussion of highest and best use that's ever been done. And he, he, he does the gymnastics. He, he says, well, you know, this really isn't the highest. Here's what it really means. And then he says, and you know, this really isn't the best. Here's what it really means. And here's a, a, one sentence from, from uh, that monogram. He says the only explicit definition of highest and best use is the most probable use of a given property at a particular period. So there it is. There is one of the best Canadian mines uh, in appraisal. And he says, all you can do with highest and best use is say it represents the most probable use. And that's been, that's been the the channel that a lot of appraisers have taken in Canada, they simply say, highest and best use is most probable use. They're the same. And that's what Lincoln North did. Uh, but as I've tried to show here, no, they're not quite the same. I already told you about that, uh, that the current appraisal materials that are used for instruction use the term probable use over and over and over. And why? Because you can't get around it. You can't. Nothing else works. Uh, Tanvir writes, so who should it best for the society? I'm not sure what you mean, but maybe you're asking uh, when it says best, who, who in the society uh, is it best for? If that's what you're saying, that's precisely my point. Um, uh, you know, for a lot of Canada's history, uh, the group and society that uh, it was best for was old white guys. So now, um, if you're not buzzed by a lot of conceptual stuff already, I'm gonna I'm gonna buzz you with it now. I want to take a step back and look at um, where we are uh, as appraisers. This is called some uh, deconstruction, and I want to talk about our belief in objectivity and and. And this comes up at every conference. It comes up in many appraisal discussions. You've got to be objective. You've got to be objective. It's professional to be objective. And, uh, and our belief is that a good appraiser is objective and our opinions are independent. And we believe appraisal is a science, that it uh, runs on cause and effect. Our method is to study things in an objective and independent way, and determine the highest and best use, and estimate a fixed point of value at a fixed point in time. We also believe, you know, in our doctrine, we say that things like the color of a building are intrinsic to the building, and factors like air contamination or recession are extrinsic. You're probably wondering what this has to do with objectivity, but we'll get there. Okay, so this slide is where we are generally. 
but here's here's a stick somebody stuck in your bicycle spokes. Three appraisers never agree. <clears throat> this is not an observation that proves that we're all disreputable. This is not an observation that proves that we're careless and negligent. This is an observation that proves when we're diligent, we come up with different answers and it proves there is no objectivity. In science, up until about 1925, there was a belief in this kind of objectivity that appraisers still believe in. But with the development of quantum mechanics and the development of the theory of relativity, science gave up the notion of being objective about everything. Science can measure how a billiard ball is diverted in its path due to the mass of the guy playing billiards or gal playing billiards. So, you know, gravity, theory of gravity keeps the moon flying around the earth. Um, my mass as a billiards player is sufficient to slightly alter the path of the ball. And not only that, but science can measure that distance. Science can actually measure how much my mass will deviate the path of a billiards ball. So my point is, you can't be really, really objective. You can't be completely objective. It doesn't happen. You can avoid being a crook or being uh, involved in a fraud, but you will never escape uh, that you are a member of a community and this community has values. So, huh? didn't stir anybody up with that one yet. All right, well, we'll move on. Another myth that's in our, in our background and in the values that appraisers live by is this myth of certainty. Uh, and it comes up in highest and best use when it's, well, a highest and best as if you can actually, what's the highest, what's the best? And we see it's this, and it's all this. It can't be, well, there's a 70% likelihood that uh, a, retail, uh, a retail building will get built, and there's a 30% chance that, you know, uh, a restaurant will get built. It's like highest and best use, it's this. And I prefer a situation where, where you say, well, well, look at this street here, and there's a 70% chance based on fact, based on, this is evidence-based, there's a 70% chance that it's going to be this and a 30% chance that it's going to be that. And, and why hasn't this caught on? I, I'm sure lots of you are doing it. But it hasn't caught on because of two things. One is, I think uh, many of us have egos that, that like the notion that we could say it's this. We know, I'm an expert, I got this, it's this. And the other reason is client preferences. Uh, lenders, you can put a range in, provided you also put a point in. But lenders want a point. They don't want... They can do without the range, or you can put the range in, and it helps provide some context. And the courts don't want a range. The courts want a point. I uh, am involved in a case where uh, an airplane pilot is accused of the, sp the spray, the weed spray from his plane, 
um, killed a whole bunch of trees on some adjoining land. And so my job was to estimate the market value uh, of the loss of the trees. Oh, I lost my train of thought when I was reading the, the points here. I'll come back to that. That one just totally flew out of my mind. Oh, I know what it was. So, so I did all kinds of surveys to find out how farmers valued trees and for how much. And I looked at a whole lot of aerial photographs of a whole lot of farmyards. And I discovered that um, um, they never valued more than three rows of trees. Uh, almost none of them planted fourth and fifth rows of trees. And, and, then I, and then I interviewed people who bought acreages and I asked them how much the trees were worth. And it was really equivocal. Uh, some of them valued the trees. Some of them said it didn't even come up in conversation. And I interviewed real estate agents about the same thing. And then I came up with one measure of uh, how much a row of trees was worth. And, so, and I, had, I had three measures that said, you know, it really doesn't look like there's any value to the fourth and fifth rows of trees. And then I had one measure that said, maybe they're worth about $2,000 a row. And the lawyer jumped on it and he said, he said, well, I want a low value and that's a low value, but we got to have a value to go to. And so, <laughs> so there's a client who, who, who wants certainty from me, who wants a conclusion that I'll go to the wall on. So that's one of the problems with, that we have with, with certainty. I'm just going to read some comments here. No, oh, it's just about volume. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, I've thrown a lot of concepts at you. Um, maybe I'll just go over this again. Of what does objectivity have to do with most probable use? And it is that objectivity leads us to this notion that we can be certain about things and that uh, we can be totally independent. Whereas our own values uh, and the values of our, of, of our community uh, have an effect on, on our appraisals. And I think, and science has abandoned this. Science doesn't talk about being objective at all. And so I think as appraisers, we should tone down the talk about objectivity, being objective. And we should assert the talk uh, about being diligent students of, of the circumstances surrounding the property that, that we have absorbed uh, the nature of the factors that are that are influencing um, future and current use on properties what are dulcet tones Okay, I already talked about how value and use. Uh, well, I haven't got there. We'll get to value and use. Here we are. Okay, so I hope you I hope you're able to see why I'm bothering to talk about objectivity and um, and certainty. Um, uh, that most probable use recognizes that that we shouldn't be putting as much emphasis 
on these ideas as we have in the past because uh, that's not how our world works. It's um, certainly it's not how science works, and uh, and we really can't be all that objective. So how are we doing? Twelve sixteen. Um, value and use. There are a number of appraisers in Canada who, I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a farmyard with a big house and there's a nice shop, newer shop. And then there's uh, two or three outbuildings that are used for storing stuff, but they're older. And the appraiser will uh, dismiss them by saying, oh, they've got value in use. Well, they're being used. But, but, but what they're implying is that this thing has no effect on market value. And that's something, uh, equating value in use with having no market value is something that only, as far as I know, only appraisers do, and not all appraisers do this. Um, but some appraisers do this. They think that when, a, when an item has, they say it has, if it has no value, no effect on market value, like an old shed, they say, oh, it has value in use. Well, it does have value in use. Um, but guess what the highest and best use is? It's also a value in use. And, and the most probable use is a value in use. So value in use simply means exactly what the words mean. There's value because it has a use. Um, this is just the example I talked about when you've got a house out on the country and you've got a older building. I'm going to skip through that. So where, where, where's the right place to put value and use? Value and use, everything that has a market value or what, what economists call a value in exchange has a value in use. That is, if a widget has no use, if nobody can find a use for a widget, then it has no value in use, right? And it has no value in exchange and it has no market value. Every single time something has market value, it's because some people have found a value in use. Does that make sense? Oh, so here's a quiz. Uh, I probably you don't have the names of some very famous uh, economists on the tip of your tongue. Uh, so I, uh, I've given you a clue. Um, under each statement, there is a capital letter, and that is the first letter of the last name of. Uh, uh, three very famous economists. Um, so my point is all of these famous economists say that value in use or use values is the basis of market value and the basis of value in exchange. Oh, oh, I see some right anders. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, lots of good stuff to comment on. Uh, Marx is right. The first one is Karl Marx. Uh, yeah, you know, um, the second oh, uh, Guy Robertson says the second one is uh, Adam Smith, which is correct. And the third one's obscure. It's a German economist named George Hegel. And the fourth one, yeah, Appraisal Institute. My point is that even the, even the communist Marx and the capitalist Adam Smith agree that, va that market value arises only when there's a value in use. So value in use doesn't mean there's no market value. Something can have value in use and, and, and not have a market value, but the reverse isn't true. And somebody was asking, uh, wouldn't value in use only be value to the owner, but not to the market as a whole? That's 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 possible, but but the use that the owner is putting it to is not necessarily unique. Like it may fill uh, the value in use, you know, say a storage for car parts or something. Uh, lots and lots of owners want a building where they can store stuff, and so I think it would be closer to say that. Um, Value in use, it can have value to a large variety, maybe virtually all potential owners, but they're simply not willing uh, to give it a market value. It's in, um, in um, real estate agent lingo, uh, it's the sizzle that goes with the stake. You can have uh, uh, an amenity in a property which isn't going to raise the value uh, of the offers that come in, but it's going to bring offers in because people, people like it. So I'll just spend a minute on um, We Value Canada because I thought, oh yeah, that's a little, you know, there's a bit of a pun there and it's cute. And then I started looking at it, and I thought, you know, there's more here than I thought initially. So the one meaning is, we value Canada, is that appraisers see worth in all aspects of, of Canada and life here. You know, we value living in Canada. We value Canada. And I thought, you know, that's really appropriate for what I'm talking about here, about how values... Um, affect our appraisals. So here it is right in the motto of the Appraisal Institute. We are admitting that, that uh, we have values which color the way we see the world and, and what, what we put meaning into. And then there's the the other meaning, in, namely that we estimate the market value. So, of these two statements, one is a value in use, right? When, when we say we value aspects of life in Canada, that's a value in use. We see, we see a way to use, to, 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 to use living in Canada, a, a way that we can get something we want. And that's a value in use. Value in use considers the values that the community believes in and lives by. So, like I say, in order for any, for, for any widget, um, People have to see a value in it.
So, value and use considers the values that the community believes in and lives by. And then I ask the question, do you hold the same values as that community? Or somewhat different? I'm coming back to my example of the farmyard with the tree belts. And uh, I happen to be a tree guy. I love trees. And, and I recognized real quickly that farmers didn't value trees as much as I did. If they had two or three rows for a windbreak, they were good. And 50% uh, the, uh, of the time, one side of each, no more than 50%, I think it was 80% of the time, one side of each farmyard would have no trees at all. So it wasn't a matter of enjoying trees, and often the side that had no trees was the side facing the road, and it wasn't a matter of privacy. Um, so I have a different value from the community whose property I was appraising. And if you don't catch that, your own bias is going to affect your result. So that's why I think it's important to understand who we are and what our values are. Um, Another example, I already, uh, I already uh, mentioned this one, is uh, resort properties on, uh, on Indian reserves. And, uh, and many of those reserves in Saskatchewan, not all, but many, have demonstrated through their actions that they don't put profit first. And um, if I'm not aware of that uh, in my appraisal work, I could uh, make some goofs. I could, you know, if I were appraising uh, resort land in a provincial park and I, and, and I used um, uh, First Nations resort land lease rates as a comparable, uh, and the values are so different, right? I mean, I could adjust. I could say, well, you know, uh, these First Nation comparable rents set a lower limit, um, a lower limit to value. <coughs> so my point about talking about value and use is it's the basis of market value, and yet it is clearly not objective in, in the way some appraisers use that term sometimes. Um, somebody's writing, but I'll lurch on here. Okay, so uh, we're coming to the end of this section, getting close to the end. Uh, this is, um, is better. It's easier to understand because the words mean what they say. Uh, it's easier to use. It's theoretically consistent with the definition of the traditional definition of or current definitions of market value. Uh, I think it's good for the profession to be developing and uh, its own advancements. And uh, it's easier for, for clients and lay people to understand, again, for the reason that, well, I, I guess that's the same point as number one. Okay, so like no good idea is uh, necessarily going to get anywhere unless you talk about um, implementation. And currently, um, 
QSPAP only has one definition for highest and best use, and it's sticking to uh, the notion of most profitable um, in the definition. So, as I say, I mean, I don't know that it'll go anywhere, but, but uh, uh, an initiative is underway to consider um, uh, providing most probable use as an alternative. Um, in uh, courses, in the appraisal courses, as I said, um, they would need a little bit of rewriting too. Uh, but as I say, they are already dominated by um, instructions to look for the probable use uh, in, in many ways. Um, oh, here's, whoa, I just got like, Whole... Sorry, going to read some of this stuff uh, in the appraisal journal back when we had an appraisal journal. And I interviewed everybody in Saskatoon who, uh, who bought a house with a swimming pool. And the, the cost of a swimming pool at that time was $10,000. And the price paid, the price that the buyer believed, the premium he believed that he, she paid for, uh, the pool range, the range was $2,000 to $10,000. At the $10,000 end was uh, a couple of uh, uh, couples who said that if, if we bought a house without a pool, we were putting one in, like we were prepared to pay uh, cost for it. But, and the, and the, and the, and the oh, it wasn't $2,000 to $10,000, sorry. The price range they felt they paid was zero dollars to ten thousand dollars, and the most common price paid was two thousand dollars. But there were several who paid zero, who felt that uh, the pool contributed nothing to to the price they paid. And I actually had one guy. He and his wife came to town. They had one weekend to buy a house. They bought this house. It had a pool. Uh, they did not want a pool at all, and they took the pool out. Um, it's a great example of the difference between value and use and market value. Terrific example. And then, and then you know, we, Heather says, I think it's more for personal enjoyment rather than added value. And that's, that's a good possibility, too. As I mentioned, there's, there's some things that um, uh, they don't add to the value, but they add what we call sizzle, you know. Okay, thank you very much for your input. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll just finish this slide off quickly, um, you know, just to put it in context. You know, if the term and use of most probable use is to grow and not have to be some kind of spliced section in your report where you call it the highest and best use section and then define both terms and so on and so on. Um, uh, you know, professional development, you're in it right now. You are in the number one groundbreaking um, course of professional development on this concept. Courts and accountants, I have not had any trouble in the courts using the term most probable use. I have not had lawyers challenge me on it. Uh, not that there's ever been such a um, too strong an issue. I guess in that First Nations uh, uh, resort uh, land rents, uh, that went to, there was actually three court hearings on that uh, 
two trial courts and one at appeal, and uh, uh, everybody everybody got it. So I think you know courts and accountants are going to be okay with it. I think other clients, um, and I brought this up already. I think a lot of clients will like it because it's it's readable and it's easy to understand. But I think, uh, as I say, there may be that a client here or there who wants who wants a report to maximize the value. How often have you had a client say, "Well, can't you just bump the value up a little bit more?" And those people may be more satisfied with highest and best use. But I think a lot of the time, <laughs> you know those folks, and uh, and it's not going to be the difference between using most probable use or highest and best use. It's like, you know, they want you to use comparable sales from uh, from uh, Fifth Avenue, New York. Oh, check the comments again. Uh, Simon's comment, that's really interesting. Um, once you reach a certain price, a pool is expected. Lack of one has a negative impact on value. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, I mean, the owner, you know, has to figure out where to put it and it has to do the contractor thing and so forth. I have that probably that same situation. Um, uh, there was a time when uh, to have a single attached garage was a big deal and then later on it was uh, a double attached garage and in neighborhoods where a double attached garages uh, were prevalent uh, there were still a few that were built with a single attached garage and the same thing happened it had a negative impact on value you had a single attached garage instead of a double People wanted a double. You didn't have the room to turn the single into a double, and the value went down. Brad, Brad, you're among the converted. Thank you. Um, and we're working on it. Um, uh, there's lots to be done. You know, one thing on implementation I didn't put in here is other appraisal professions. And there is, um, rightly or wrongly, uh, some belief that we ought to be doing what everybody else is doing. And we need to show some leadership here and, and put this out there. And secondly, I'd say I'm not sure why we have to do what everybody else does. We broke away from everybody. We were on USPAP uh, for years, and uh, uh, we decided to go our own way on that. I happen to be one to think it was a mistake, but we did it. And um, uh, we're going to make a huge break, like setting up our own professional standard. Uh, this seems like small potatoes compared to that. Wade says, typical purchaser and probable price would go hand in hand, question mark. If, if you're saying by typical purchaser you mean the most probable purchaser, then, then yeah. Um, because if the guy who's going to pay more than anybody else, that is the highest price, He's not the typical purchaser, is he? He's the atypical purchaser. He's the, he's the one in 20. So yes, I agree with you that the typical purchaser is the one who's offering the most probable price. I hope I got what you were after there, Wait, I'm not sure about that. So we've reached, uh, we've only got 15 minutes left. We're not going to get anywhere near through this next section, which is fine. Uh, I'd much rather um, have spent the time on, on most probable use because I, um, 
uh, I'm hoping it will uh, become a reality uh, for as at least as an alternative for use. Um, and as I say, things are in the works, both with various um, appraisal institute of Canada committees and with uh, the solder school. But I but I can't promise anything at all. Um, uh, this might not be the time and place for this initiative, and so uh, I'm not holding out anything. And uh, you know, maybe if I were sitting there at this point, I'd be thinking, "Well, using it." Um, and 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 maybe we should be looking at new ideas, and maybe only of the five new ideas we look at, maybe only three of them are going to be adopted, but, but, but we won't adopt any if we don't look at any. So complex adaptive systems, I'm going to see what I can do with this in uh, 10 minutes. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I'm going backwards in time. So I'm jumping through. Okay, complex adaptive systems. This is an outgrowth of, uh, you'll remember, uh, chaos theory and fractal theory. This is an application of those ideas, and you probably you got a whiff of it in my presentation where the role of uncertainty and the role of, uh, uh, of relativity rather than objectivity uh, are, are recognized. Um, and so you'll recognize a lot of these statements have, have a lot to do with what's happening in James Grasscamp's uh, and my presentation of most probable use. Many constituents, uh, some acting in unexpected ways, many of them are independent, there's competition and cooperation, there's interplay of <coughs> chaos and non-chaos. I haven't talked about discontinuous change and I haven't talked about system displays on many levels. And it gives rise to an emerging behavior. And for us appraisers, that would be the emerging behavior is the emerging land use that comes out of all this. So I came across this model of complex adaptive systems uh, probably five years ago. And I went, whoa, this is, this is like most probable use only better because uh, it takes into account a whole bunch of other stuff. Now you will have the, I'll do an example and I, because I think it's a really instructive example and it helps talk about leadership too. And this will be the, I think I can, I can get through this in 10 minutes. So you may have heard about this uh, Proposition 13 in California. And uh, um, this is an example of, of the real world. This is the example of the way things actually go. So in 1978, California voters supported a freeze on property taxes. And, uh, and that, and that uh, policy led to more retail and less housing. It also led to legal and legislative gridlock. And it resulted in less development. Now I have to find the details for that. Maybe I left them out. Let me tell you what happened here. Um, so there was a freeze on property taxes and uh, California didn't have enough money uh, to pay the bills because they weren't raising it on taxes. And so uh, they gave the they gave the 
Yeah, I don't have the details real clear. Sorry. I'll skip to the next one, which which uh, which is also from California. California passed a legislation that they had to have fuel efficient vehicles. Sounds like a great um, environmentally conscious move. But what happened was a few accountants, and I don't mean to diss on them, took a look at the numbers and they realized they could relocate their business out of town out to the suburbs or even out in the country and they could they could buy fuel efficient vehicles and their total cost for fuel and travel was no higher than it was before uh, and they were saving money on property taxes and building acquisition because they were out in the boondocks instead of uh, in the city center. And so the net result of fuel efficient vehicle legislation in California was urban sprawl. And so what what complex adaptive systems does is it recognizes that we make decisions in um, in a universe where there's significant uncertainty and um, and we'll be wrong some of the time and so we want to have a system of decision making where we can roll back decisions that don't work and currently in the political climate in just about everywhere in the free world certainly Canada and uh, United States we hold we hold our politicians feet to the fire when they make a mistake when when the when the result of their initiative doesn't work and every time a politician changes his mind about something, we castigate them for them. He's always got no character. He's got no principles. But I think an evidence-based look at this stuff, and, and I'm sure our own lives give us this, this uh, same conclusion. We make decisions so many times with very little information. And so we should be less willing to castigate our politicians and more willing to say, well, you know what? Um, that didn't work. And, and find ways that, first of all, so we can get feedback quickly as to what's going on when we make a change. Oh, I don't know. Uh, fuel taxes, carbon tax. I mean, you could think of, uh, of a half dozen things in our own life, uh, pipelines, um, pretty hard to roll back a pipeline. Uh, but these decisions, uh, this was an eye-opener for me because I thought, oh, stupid politician ways. We have to give them some, uh, we have to cut them some slack. Yes, media castigates, throws the first stone, says Brad. Yeah, that's true. Although I used to like to get in there and, you know, Try to try to be one of the first two. Um, so we're down to like five minutes or four minutes, according to me. So this whole uh, other model, which is a very broad, holistic model, uh, and, and it, <clears throat> I won't be able to get through it, but it's in the slides that you have access to. And uh, why are we ending on a call? Oh, I have one request for you. I do have one request to give you in three minutes. Um, there is an evaluation uh, uh, system for you to use where, where, uh, that's run by UBC. But I would like you uh, to do your own, uh, to do my own evaluation. And unfortunately, there's no way to keep it um, uh, 